You're listening to Out of the Box, a place for marketers to get inspired, get going, and break out of the box. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jess Overton. Today, I'm joined by Thomas Petit, an independent mobile growth consultant with nearly 13,000 followers on Twitter. And today, we're going to discuss trends in subscription apps and how to optimize and grow yours in today's ecosystem. Thomas, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here and chat with you today. Fantastic. So before we get started, I, I want to talk a little bit about where you come from, what your history is and how you got involved in the app economy. So tell me, what's your story? Um, so if we go back a bit more than 10 years ago, I was, I was working for a few different startups, uh, mostly in the e-commerce scene. I was in Barcelona at the time and uh, e-commerce was, was uh, kind of what a lot of, of um, startups were focusing on. And I slowly started seeing like uh, app store becoming like apps, becoming a thing like a small thing at the time and i thought it was really interesting so i sent my cv to every company i could i could find out there which were game company because at the time they were mostly gaming really and uh, yeah send my cv everywhere um 90 didn't answer the other 10 percent told me i'm lacking three four years of mobile marketing experience which I find it hilarious if you consider that was 2011 or, <laughs> or something. Um, and uh, so I stick to my, to my let's say, e-commerce uh, and slowly subscription, some business, uh, but not app subscription. And up to 2014 or 15, and uh, one founder just believed I could, I could adjust to what it takes on mobile. And I joined a fitness app at the very beginning of the subscription apps boom where there was pretty much everything to to figure out because the book the playbook wasn't written um but yeah i was out of the trust of of really one one founder one startup founder and uh, i was just lucky to be at the right place at the right time because from there it's been all up and to the right um yeah fun ride absolutely it's amazing how many of uh, how many stories i hear of people who had just just needed that one person who was going to take a chance on them a mixture of luck and timing and and I'm sure the uh, uh, your uh, uh, your history brought you to the right place at the right time. No, yes. too bad for the others, but uh, it went well with that particular founder. So I'm happy with that story. <laughs> so I, I now I understand where you got your start in subscription apps. Uh, I mean, really, you know, walking into a, a, that sort of an opportunity with no playbook written. There are many, I guess, who would bang their heads against the wall and wonder what to do, and there are many who would start to write the playbook, right and uh, and uh, fortune favors the brave. So that's, uh, uh, it's good that, that you were able to walk into that. A subscription pricing model, you know, it, it allows you a lot of different things, right? Uh, it certainly allows you to predict uh, future incomes. Uh, it allows you to enjoy recurring revenue, which is, which is obviously something. But I want you to talk a little bit, or I'd like to go into a little bit about what goes into actually managing a subscription, given that in today's landscape, I think, Consumers expect a lot, right? We have really high expectations, and continuing to to engage users across the first years of subscription and and making sure they're engaged over you know the 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 LTV of of the user is something that that I'm sure is very challenging. Talk to me a little bit about how you can ensure success in subscriptions. Yeah. I I guess, I guess the, the beauty of it, not only like being able to predict revenue and, and, and so on, is, is really that it aligns interest between, between users and developers. If you go back before there were subscriptions, um, if, we, if we forget gaming, that is slightly different in its business model and less adopted in subscription, maybe we'll talk about that. If you look before subscriptions in the early days, the, the dominant business model was really paid up, paid up front, you know, premium up. So you would... You'd have to pay before you even see any of it, which is kind of a first problem, huge barrier of entry, uh, not convenient uh, for freemium, for marketing, not convenient for the user to have to pay like uh, before a them. so not great. But then there was zero incentive for the developer to actually provide anything after you pay, you know? And usually those prices were pretty low, like uh, one, two, five dollar, I would say four, five dollar was, was pretty common. They used to be more expensive app, but then the obstacle was, was a lot higher. I guess one of the beauty of this is that it aligns interest in the sense of 
the user can get a glimpse of it. They don't like it. They cancel their refund. They, they just stop paying. Um, but the developer is pushed to actually provide uh, new content to provide like something that will make you come back and is rewarded by recurring revenue in a much higher, let's say, um, uh, proportion than with the paid app. So I think at the end of the day, it is somewhat beneficial to everybody here um, and obviously to whoever takes the cut in the middle uh, because it's a higher value. But uh, I think it's a much better system. There was a few apps uh, at the very beginning that were problematic because they were charging, but then they weren't maintained at all. Like here, you don't maintain, you lose your subscribers. So I think it's a nice incentive. Um, in some cases, it's even slightly abused in the sense that there is not this, let's say, recurring uh, improvement and, um, and content coming, a bit of a money land grab for some people who use subscription business, but actually don't bet on, on renewal and retention. Uh, but I mean, that's at the edge. There will always be some cases. I think overall, it is a very interesting model for that because it pushes you to always improve, always provide and look for the long term. It's not for every business uh, either. Um, I think, uh, yeah, in some cases, people are just like adopting subscription just because or just because it's hot, where it doesn't mean it makes sense for every kind of business. So it does make sense for a lot of, I mean, especially in content, uh, content subscription like uh, Netflix, uh, Spotify and so on. Sure, you know, you come, you consume the content. Uh, you don't like, no, there's a lot of switchers because there's so many services. I think in this particular case, it makes a lot of, of sense. I understand why a lot of gaming apps didn't adopt subscription. I think uh, they, they found a very successful way. And in many cases, just doesn't fit the the, the mechanics of, of how the, the, the interaction between, between user and developer is made. Sure. Are there any other types of apps that you can think of off the top of your head that aren't sort of um, that subscription wouldn't be a good choice for them because gaming seems yep. like you know I can I can certainly understand that. Where else do you think is is subscription not so relevant? Uh, maybe not a vertical, but maybe when you when you are when you have a target of um, of uh, let's say lo lower power purchasing countries, um, putting subscription is like a big deal. Uh, a lot of people would maybe not even have, have access to a credit card that you can bill this way, or the usual price of subscription is like really high for uh, uh, many, many countries, especially on the Android side um, in, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. Um, and, and I mean, if you're, if you're trying to sell, I don't know, fitness services in, in India where Android is 95% and a lot of people are outside of the banking system, maybe the subscription model is not, not fitting your audience and, and you have to find other ways through, through ads, through through affiliates, through partnerships, B2B, uh, and so on. So sometimes the vertical and the nature of the business itself, sometimes it's uh, it's the audience you're trying to reach, I guess. Yeah, so it's really knowing your landscape and and, and understanding your target audience exactly. at the end of the day, yeah, right? Yeah. I think we're seeing Netflix is really starting to shift into that right now, where they're, mm -hmm. where they're launching their, their sort of ad-supported model as well, which is uh, they're starting to understand a little bit more about the Indian Southeast Asian market where the subscription model was a challenge. Yeah, that's extremely I want to exciting take you back. to see. Uh, sorry, it's extremely exciting to see uh, what Netflix is doing. Um, um, maybe we'll get to that in a in a bit. But uh, I'm particularly bullish on on mixed models, mixed business models, where you don't rely just on one method. And I think this experiment that Netflix is doing is is uh, is great in that matter because there's no not so many cases uh, of subscription mixing with other things. And um, yeah, I have a couple of thoughts around that. But let's still put a little caveat into that. Like a lot of, especially in subscription, a lot of people tend to benchmark themselves against um, uh, Disney Plus or, or Netflix or Spotify or Apple Music. And I think for most cases, it's actually wrong. Like because a lot of them, they're not exactly this content subscription. I mean, when you subscribe to to Netflix or Disney, what you're interested in is you want to see Orange Is the New Black. You want to see Stranger Things. You're not taking it really just because it's the Netflix brand. Um, whether a lot of subscription apps that are not content subscription, I call them more lifestyles or education, health and fitness, uh, even productivity. Um, I, don't, I don't think the mechanics are exactly the same. So I, I'm still careful about like porting what Netflix is doing, but it's still a very interesting live experiment that we're going to, that we're going to see develop in front of our eyes. And I'm certainly looking at it. 
For sure. So so let's let's unpack a little bit more of that bullishness that you yeah. have for the mixed model. Yeah. Let's uh, let, let's go into that. Tell me more. So mo most of the subscription apps they just have subscriptions. Like this is the only way they they monetize their audience. Like uh, and they focus on that. In many cases, when you when you're starting, uh, it's better to focus on one thing than uh, introduce a lot of complexity. And I understand it. And uh, probably you don't want to get too complex too early, but at some point in the growth phase, um, I see I see a problem with uh, with the subscription model, and it's a double problem, which I call it uh, high floor, low ceiling. High floor because the barrier of entry is maybe ten dollar a month or or sixty dollar a year or whatever, and like we commented before, uh, in some countries this is just like an insanely high barrier, and you're not enabling. 90% plus of the audience to actually experience, experience your, the, 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 the full extent of, of what your product is doing. So it's kind of a very high barrier that you're putting. Um, so that's why I call the, the high floor. And I think there are ways to lower this floor. Um, could be through discount, but it could be through offering, I don't know, a weekly pass or um, share with your friend and I'll unlock for a weekend or... Um, Look at a rewarded video and I, and I unlock these three recipes or whatnot. You know, there are ways to lower down the floor, but you have to introduce like different mechanics. And it's got a problem of high ceiling, which is, I mean, one of the reasons gaming has been so successful on the App Store and, and has constituted the bulk of the revenue for, for so many years is I think they really cracked this um, revenue curve where the 90% of people who don't want to pay hey, you can play, no problem. Maybe you'll get ads, but uh, no worries. You're not limited that much. Um, and then those who want to pay just a little bit, sure, we've got this $2 IAP or whatever, and you can improve a little bit your experience or remove the ads or whatnot. And then you've got wells. And a lot of the games economy is based on wells that like just a few payers that would represent maybe half of the revenue. I, I was reading the other day that for Candy Crush, it's the 2% of the 2% that represent half. And so zero zero four percent, and I think wow. here you 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 see how in the subscription business that's problematic because once you've got this subscriber in at ten dollar a month, that's it. It's the end of the of the line, and you're not extracting any value from this superpower user that maybe could be interested in additional services. That's why. I, that, so that's why I call it uh, a low ceiling. Is you're limiting yourself with your power user where there's probably a lot more to do. And I'm seeing very few people uh, think about that. In, in, in some cases you have, like for example, Tinder has different tiers of subscription. So they can like sell some super duper premium uh, ones that are uh, very expensive. And that's one way to crack it. I'm more thinking about going beyond just uh, subscriptions. Um, one example would be you can blend some e-commerce in that. So there's this fitness app that's called Sweat that have a shop like, uh, and, and so you can buy some, um, um, foam and t-shirts and water bottles and whatnot, like $30 water bottles. Yeah. But it's branded to, to Sweat, which for a few number of very power users as, as a great value, like, yeah, I want my water bottle to be the one from the app I'm using every day. And, and I think this is one other way of breaking this, this low ceiling um, that for most subscription is, yeah, binary. You're subscribed, you're not subscribed. That's it. Um, which I think in the long term, we'll start seeing a lot more of, of, of steps in this, uh, in the, in the, in this curve, uh, which is pretty much what Netflix is trying to do here. Like, I mean, they already introduced different tiers where you can share and you've got more HD and I don't know even all the options. But like, and it depends the country, but I think where I am, there's a $9 one, $11 and $14 or whatever. And now they're going to have the ad tier. And so they're basically trying to break this one for all binary situation into, uh, yeah, we also have something for you. You want to pay less? You're still welcome. You want to pay more? Absolutely. Like, um, so I think in the long term, we'll get more into that direction. Uh, it's still a very young uh, uh, space and we're still discovering a lot of things. So um but that's why i'm excited about it is i'm starting to see it and i think in the long term that's where that's where it gets uh introduce a bit of complexity for a lot of people so don't do it too early interesting i love the uh the the high floor low ceiling framework is a great way to think about it and certainly i think that the sweat example is a is a 
is a great way to think very far out of the box, right? I think if we if you take sort of traditional tech where even in, in incorporating gaming elements into a non-gaming space was uh, was something that was was very different mm -hmm. going into selling merch and, and and all sorts of other out of the box add-ons is uh, uh, is a very exciting way to do yeah it, it could be like i think here it really depends the nature of your business like here sweat is particular in that sense that she built a very solid community behind her, uh, her brand and a her, and her person so there is a strong like a recognition of people who wants that, which is not necessarily going to work for everybody. Like, doesn't mean introduce an e-commerce to a subscription. Like, for some people, it's going to be something completely different. Um, I've seen some people selling like some some uh, Apple Music songs inside an app that is unrelated because it's just uh, because it was related. Or I mean, there's so many things you can do. I was I was looking at a. I don't want to specify too much, but let's say psychology related uh, digital service or so an app where a mental health app basically. And so you'd pay, I can't remember the price, but let's say $10, $10 a month or $100 a year. And you've got this, this content and this AI that helps you and exercise and logs and stuff. But they, they identified that they've got a very small percentage of their users that actually need and want more. And they've got this super premium uh, pay a hundred bucks uh, uh, an hour to get actually personalized service, so you can get a video chat with uh, uh, with a professional that already knows your case and can adjust to it, uh, and kind of um, go. You don't have like to 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 move, and in this case, made a lot of sense for them to introduce like kind of one to one uh, uh, very premium service that costs for an hour the price of the yearly subscription when it's on on digital. So. I guess here, don't try to fit like a circle into a square, but rather think of what is complementary to what I'm doing that is actually interesting, this small percentage of power user that have the financial capability to put a lot more money on the table and not really just say, okay, Sweat has done the e-commerce, I'm going to do the e-com and then nobody, nobody is going to buy your crap merch because your app doesn't have this community effect. So I guess very much about thinking what, what fits and Hey, it goes back to the basic and listen to your user. What do they want? And then you just provide. That's just uh, how business works, I guess. For sure. So I, you know, we've we've gotten into a lot of interesting uh, uh, areas in power users, but I want to go back to the start, sure. which is how to actually get people paying the subscription. So talk to mm. me about how you see the onboarding process, how you see placing a paywall. How do you how do you how do you look at the mechanics of actually converting a uh, a person who's considering being a subscriber into a paying subscriber? It, it, it's it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting that you go this way because I see the the more the more uh, my career develop and I get to touch a bit more topics around around a lot of things around retention around monetization than just just pure acquisition, which is my my background. Uh, I always come back to like work work more on your onboarding. This is all, almost always where the lowest hanging fruits are, and you've never done enough at this point. I mean, the 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 churn rate is really hard on on apps in general and subscription apps in particular. So whatever you can do before you lose user is usually more effective than battling to have them come back by improving your email copy and paying for remarketing, and which also makes sense at some stage and at some point, but uh, if your onboarding is not like at a certain level, usually that's where the low hanging fruits are. And and I see it for for myself. Like when when I was in paid acquisition, I was always looking um, how can I improve five percent, you know. And at some point, uh, marginal gains were becoming so small in what I could do on my side around um, the few levers we have and creative and so on. I say I actually need to go and intervene on what we're doing on the onboarding because I'm seeing so much more we can do uh, to improve there. I, I just thought the, the effort uh, impact ratio was higher. And what I realized now, a few years later, probably like uh, five, six years later, is that it's almost always the case. Like uh, changing stuff in the onboarding has such a massive impact uh, on the first time experience, let's call it, or, or the activation. Uh, huge impact on monetization. That's how you, you, you get people to subscribe. Huge impact on retention. Uh, that's of course you need then to provide also the value on the go and 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 you can push it through CRM, but really onboarding is where you know uh, you 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 make or lose it. Like uh, and 
And at the end of the day, also acquisition. Uh, most acquisition is done with signals that are very early, even more so now with the scan network, but uh, it was always the case before. And honestly, the, the, the better signal you can provide on, on what this traffic source looks like uh, compared to that one or whatever, thanks to how you, you can even design your onboarding in a way that is actually meant for acquisition and not just for user experience, because you've got this, this uh, stronger signals about how, how this, this, this traffic, this source, this creative or whatnot is, is performing. So basically impacts like pretty much everybody and, and very often a, a, a big, big impact. There's many ways to do onboarding. Um, when you're a massive, massive brand, like I guess, he, he, look at Netflix, you know, the, there's no onboarding. It's kind of, you arrive and you have to pay. That's it, like uh, <laughs> next. But because people already know Netflix, you know, they don't really need to be onboard. Like it's kind of, okay, I put my credit card and then I put on play like, and that's it. Like I already know what I'm going to get and the, the usage is pretty, pretty intuitive. For most apps, I would be very, well, I've seen some apps have success putting the paywall as the very first thing. And that kind of surprised me. Uh, I know some people are, are doing great using this, but uh, uh, typically um, that's not how we build it. Uh, kind of using the onboarding as, as a warm up on, on, many, on many fronts, like explain better what you do, show people, get them to experience the, like, the core value, uh, probably, and you need to mix up a little bit also of stuff you probably need for other purpose. Maybe you need a sign up to synchronize the account. Maybe you need the ATT prompt. And I guess here there's a bit of art and magic of how do I balance like kind of this wow effect and positive impre first impression on user with the friction that I have to introduce because I want them to uh, opt in the push notification and give me their email and and start completing this task because I I need them to to do it and there is here a balance that is not not like uh, not easy to to find and that I find particularly uh, intellectually stimulating but also particularly impactful like massive impact on on the business. I want to take you back to, to to what you said originally when you were working on the subscription. You said you had to intervene. You're sorry, you were working on user acquisition. You yes. said you had to intervene on the uh, on the onboarding process. So talk to me a little bit about how the organization needs to be structured in order to make sure that all of the teams are working together to really smooth that out because each one must play a big role. Yeah, no. Uh... Sure, it's that, that that's a big that's a big question, and obviously there's not there's not one way to to structure the team to guarantee that. It's clear that it's better if you manage to break a little bit the the silo. A lot of it, I mean, and different culture will have different answers to that. But uh, the um, a huge factor here is is size. I mean, when you're starting and and the marketing team is two people and and the product team is four people and there's two data guys. I mean, it's pretty easy to sync between monetization and onboarding and, and acquisition. And suddenly uh, each team is 10 and then there's five teams for each and, and so on. And, and then it gets really hard, you know, to keep this, this, uh, this connection. And because things are intertwined, those who actually manage to structure bigger teams to understand how it impacts the other one are, are very often the winners. But in practice, it's really hard to do. And I have to say myself, I'm, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing today because over, over time I got lucky to, so I started with mostly paid acquisition, but then, as I said, like kind of a, a bit by chance and by necessity started dabbling around uh, more onboarding stuff and more paywalls and so on. And that led me to actually today do less, like execute less on all this front, but be more of, sometimes I qualify it like being the glue between these departments. So I'm kind of a free electron between different teams and trying to to keep things, you know, uh, in the loop and, oh, careful, they've been doing that. That's why our metric is crashing because they've been, you know, I don't know, changing the paywall or, or injecting a gazillion install from a dubious source or, or whatnot. And and I, I find it extremely exciting myself to be, to have this privilege to like that some founder would, would trust me to like, just tell me, yeah, go, go in between teams. You're in no team, you're, you're in every team. And, and I find it extremely exciting. So my role in that is very particular because it's unusual to have like kind of this figure and I, and I feel uh, very yeah, privileged, but uh, I mean, I know I'm doing myself, but it's hard to structure it as a, as a company, you know, kind of, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm a lucky person here. 
<laughs> well, I really like that model. I have to say that sort of uh, a free range electron in the middle there that uh, that could sort of move between and keep track of things. It certainly it doesn't seem like it would be a plug and play solution that's easy to structure, but no. it, it definitely makes a lot of sense. It, it usually works. I mean, I, I'm, I'm doing it for a couple of different teams. It usually works because the, the founder or CEO has a massive trust in, in just me and just told me, yeah, do your thing. Like, uh, I trust it will go good. Uh, sometimes it's hard for the teams I work with, you know, because uh, I wouldn't follow all the development and suddenly I would crash in the room and, and break the whole roadmap and say, okay, we're going to do this because the other team needs it like right now, which I'm a pain in the ass, honestly, literally. Like, but uh, yeah, it's been fun. On the on the long term, we're, we're having good fun. On on the day to day, you know, uh, yeah, everything has its challenge. But uh, I'm always I'm always interested to hear how the people structure their team to minimize this impact of, of silo and how like, you know, uh, marketers have zero leverage on how you onboard users and maybe the pricing team would be completely disconnected from the onboarding which is like kind of bizarre or maybe the team doing some promos is disconnected from uh, uh, from that too and yeah it, it's hard to keep it uh, all connected when you're a larger team and uh, but definitely uh, an interesting challenge yeah for sure when it comes to advertising for subscriptions do you think that it's different from advertising from for apps with other monetization models. Is there a requirement or a a need, an advantage, a risk to communicating the business model in some way at the ad stage? Yeah, for sure. They're, they're, they're pro and cons. Um, I mean, one of the cons is what you, what you're selling is is less exciting for people than than typically gaming. That would that would enjoy lower CPI just because people engage like. It's fun, you know, it's entertainment. Like uh, when you're trying to sell, a, a bunch of subscriptions are more lifestyle and fun, but a lot of them, they're, they're solving hard problems about, I don't know, I work with a um, couple of relationship app, for example, like, uh, and the, the market is there, the need is there, but when you read it, it's certainly less fun than just, you know, matching some uh, candy or, or whatnot. So yeah, typically yeah, I see sure. subscription apps have much, much higher CPIs than, than, uh, other vertical, especially since you're trying to attract subscriber and only a fraction of these people would actually pay. So, uh, it's really hard to like your, the, the, the price are high. I mean, it's not FinTech level, but, uh, still really high, like to craft creative that are exciting, but start bridging into what the problem you're actually solving. Let's say that's a bit of a, of a con, which is only partially uh, um, answering your question and notice. In terms of what you can communicate exactly around the subscription, I think here, like there's different ways to do it, obviously. Like, uh, and, and I'm seeing some apps communicate a lot more about the premium features, even about the price. I'm seeing a lot of apps communicate about Sign up for free and free trial and whatnot, which I typically uh, try to not do. Uh, I tell the teams I work with, I don't want to see the F word in the in the ads, which typically would raise click through rate and and lower CPIs. But then you attract exactly the kind of user you're not looking for. Um, and I, I have more on that too, but I'm gonna leave it there. Um, typically, <laughs> I I tend to not specify too much into the creative the business model the reason being i already have so much to explain about the problem we're solving the kind of solution we are show a little bit what it looks like like there's so much things attention span is like a, a second you know on the feed and the message i want to give is not about my business model and the price and the incentive and there's a promo and a discount maybe if you're very well known you can say i'm in a vertical for example where i have a competitor that has a brand awareness that is 100x of, of ours. And their communication is a lot on price because everybody knows them. Everybody knows what they do. So the trigger to get in is, oh, actually, there's a cheaper way. Cool. But when we come in the market, like if we were talking about price, they would say, I don't even know what you do. Like, what, like the discount is doing nothing on me. Like, And I think here you can't accumulate too many messages. So uh, typically that, the, the model is not uh, like the... the the price and the fact that there's premium features and whatnot, it's also a bit of an obstacle, really. Like it kind of lowers the CPR, so not necessarily. And I think this transition between, hey, here's what I'm selling you and how I'm going to sell you, like through the price and the model, is something that I have a lot more liberty and time to do in the onboarding. Like something that I can do 
craft uh, in a much more like complex way with some uh, like a lot of, of uh, psychology behind it. Whether I mean in the ads, it's so fast. You know, you need to just catch. You're, you're catching attention. You know? you're, you're once the attention is called, then yeah, you've got time a little bit to introduce this and that. So that's why, personally, uh, I'm I'm not sharing much about the fact that it's a subscription, that there's a free trial, that it's eggs, that that it's monthly, that whatnot. That's something that people will discover once down the road when they're like, yeah, I, I want this solution. Like uh, I'm interested in this. I want to play piano better or, or I want to resolve my mental health problem or I want to be a better reader or whatever. And then, okay, it's 10 a month. Yeah, but if I'm a better reader, if I can read twice as fast, huh, I'll pay for it because I'm seeing the value. Um, so typically I don't, I don't uh, promote a lot of it yet. I think for bigger companies, it makes more sense to communicate on that because I mean, let's say you see an ad for Apple Fitness Plus, whatever, well, you already know what they're doing, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah, you don't need to. You don't need a lot of context on that one. Yeah, exactly. And you you mentioned that uh, you mentioned that, uh, and I think you know it, it goes without saying that attention spans are at probably all time lows. But uh, uh, but I don't have any data to back that one up. Do you think that in terms of of how a, a subscription app is marketed or what channels they're marketed on, that there's different effects there than than perhaps the uh, uh, than the gaming apps uh, have experienced? What what should the average app marketer do if they're just dipping their toes into marketing a subscription app? Uh, I mean, same. The, the situations depends a bit and the scale, but there, there's something that I, I, I find it uh, interesting now because things are finally changing. But let's say for for a few years, and so let's 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 make it simple and sell uh, up to ATT last year, a year ago, or a year and a half now. Um, pretty much every subscription app that I was seeing was like, I'm going all in on, on what I call the sands. So like Facebook, Google, TikTok, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Apple, and have actually very little success outside of, of these networks. But uh, yeah, the Facebook and Google of the world was like, okay, here's my free trial, go and look for trialists. And they would do, the, do that in a magical way. Like, uh, and it was really hard to compete with that. Like just, there was a natural fit between the audience and the placement. There was a, a, a me event mechanics behind that was extremely powerful. And honestly, there was also laziness from marketers of, of uh, getting into more complexity. And you'd, you'd seen in the marketing mix of subscription app, very little DSPs, very little uh, SDK networks and so on, which for me was always curious. Why is, it, why is it working for everybody else? It is not working for my apps. And I don't have a definite answer to that, but, uh, and if I mention this, so it's kind of ironic that I mentioned this on this particular podcast and I don't mean bad to anybody, but I mention it because I think things are changing now. Like kind of ATT introduced a, a, a change that has good and bad. Uh, most of us will see the bad part, I guess, but for networks and subscription apps, I think the, the, the fit is actually, uh, uh, better than it used to be now. And, uh, uh, kind of, it changed the way we look at data and the way we look also at at dependency towards some uh, some some of our um, UA providers, let's say. And I'm seeing more apps now expanding. Uh, I'm also seeing more networks being a lot more interested in subscription app than they've been before. Uh, maybe because they've noticed it's it's also growing share of the of the total store revenue. So there's a bit of everything at the same time, like the scale, the maturity around it um the maturity of marketers on the other side like it, it it takes everybody you know to change uh the change in not regulation but like kind of measurement also and and i'm really seeing things changing a little bit now and um and yeah i mean a lot of these networks were also built for gaming and in some case for e-coms and now they're realizing this big opportunity and and providing also a more suitable service for for a lot of subscription apps and how, how they like the funnel events are managed and so on. And, uh, and I think it's good. Like, uh, it gives more, give more weapons, you know, in the, in the toolbox of, of marketers, uh, and also for the networks. Like, so, I mean, it's, it's for the better, you know, when you talk about the shift for, of, of networks from sort of being focused specifically on gaming, moving towards subscriptions, what do you think is happening there? What are the mechanics that those networks can better give to subscription apps that they haven't done to date? 
Yeah, that that's a hard question. Eh? Well, the first one is understanding. It doesn't work the same. I remember like a few years ago, and I would have a few networks approach me and just have their pitch for something that is completely irrelevant because they just didn't understand at all how how user become subscriber, how this how this like kind of binary state of subscribe not subscribe gets, and is very different to gaming. Also, where like the the the, the development of the, the revenue curve uh, coming, you know, they would just not understand it. So here, here it's more human, I would say, in the, you know, in account management and so on, being being used to it and being trained for it, which we're, we're now getting. But a few years ago, it was like just banging my head, having to do some some education work for people who are paid uh, three times what I'm paid and, and work in Dublin. And, and I have to get them from zero to understand how our business works which is like, frankly, frustrating. That's not the case anymore. I mean, there's a lot of people that have been uh, that are aware and are a really good specialist of the model now. From, from the tech building, there's one thing I always wish to have in the past. And now with the SCAD network, this is, this is really complicated, which is what I call that kind of a multi-funnel event, uh, basically because the network would over-optimize for my free trial that has the benefit that it starts really early after the install. So that's a beautiful signal. But then they would force so much on this that they would attract typically cohort, the typical cohort of people who can sell very fast, you know, like, uh, and there is an extreme share of people who instant cancel after they start a free trial. So they don't get charged after a week or whatnot. And, and the network would over optimize towards this cohort. And the more it would go and the more I would churn these trials that I thought were positive signals, and there's something that I wanted to exist for a long time, which is, can you actually optimize for the free trial, but have this, this other event that comes three days later or seven days later or whatnot, or, or that, that feed you in bulk from the last year or, or whatever, and that so that you would optimize towards both things, you know, get people engaged. But what's most important for me is actually that they stay uh, because that means money coming in, but that means I'm delivering value to them. They're using the app and so on. And that's something that was not really done, uh, like on Funnel. Of course, now with a scale network, that's not really an option that we have. So we have to right. we have to get on our side. Like typically, I would do this work on my side, on the on the on the advertiser side. As in, instead of sending my free trial, I would send an event that bundles. Okay, this user has done the free trial, has not canceled within twenty minutes, is done an activity in the first hour. He hasn't done the whole sign-up process in less than 30 seconds because I detect the people who do next, 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 and so on. And I would layer all this stuff into like this quality trial even that I do on my side and feed to the network. But I guess here, like if the network had a little bit more ability to understand like the, the layer that we put on the or, or on top of the free trial, it would force a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people in the subscription business optimize acquisition for, for free trials. And it's got some beautiful magic in it, but it's got some drawbacks that uh, a lot of people are underestimating. And, and that would be nice if there was a bit more capability around that. I think the the, the take on the, the layered free trial event for the scan, uh, the scan network is something that, that I've thought about. I'm interested to hear from you how, I, I want to I say popular, but I'm not sure if that's the right thing. How, do you see that actually happening? Because it seems like the logical thing to do. But so, it's also a very, a very nuanced bet to take, right? You have to be relatively sophisticated to get there, no? I don't know. I started doing that in 2017, so I wouldn't say so. But <laughs> uh, when, when I saw that that UAC, when it was born, was actually sending me all these counselors and, and I had to fight against it, you know? And the layers of, of, I would filter, I would have the age of user back then and, and uh, I would filter user, so... The free trial even is not sent if the user is under 18 or 20 or whatnot, like because they just can't pay. But it's not so complex, but there are limitations because you have to layer it with something that you get instantly. So typically, some activities can't be done instantly. Like, I don't know, in the fitness space, maybe you can't do a workout right when you download the app and you're going to do it in the next morning and that's too late for, for the marketer. So that's, that's a challenge. Um, I was talking about the instant cancellation before. That even is not coming from the app. It's coming from Apple servers, which means that feeding it back to a SCAD network is not reliable because if the user closed the app, then that event is never sent, uh, which is very problematic to encode. So I used to do it before. I'm not using that particular one anymore. 
But I'll get back to something I said earlier, and I think in gaming is 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 something that is more common, which is sometimes you have to design your onboarding, not only from a user user experience perspective and to maximize like how users understand your features and so on, but also to take into account some needs uh, in this particular case from the, the the acquisition side. Are there some questions that I can or some actions that I can make the user do? which primary purpose is actually to improve the, the signals that I can use for acquisition and not primarily used to onboard user. So you have to design it in a very smart way to get to this point because, uh, but uh, I think in, in gaming, there's a lot more smartness around this kind of uh, approach than there is outside where we take what we have in the morning and it's like, okay, what can I use? And I think there's a step beyond that, which is, how can I change the, the design itself so that it serves me better in my in my acquisition purpose? Very interesting. Uh, Thomas, I think we've had a, a, a super interesting conversation to now. <laughs> I do want to ask you because you I, 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 I follow a lot of what you uh, what you say on Twitter. You're you're pretty close to the cutting edge of, of almost everything that I see. How do you stay on top of trends? How do you keep in in the loop so acutely? Uh, I guess I like it uh, first, so I, li I like to like uh, follow stuff, and uh, because I'm uh, I'm my own boss, I consider that it's part of my job and my duty to dedicate maybe uh, twenty thirty percent of my of my weekly time on reading stuff, exchanging with people, uh, reading case studies, uh, meeting somebody new, meeting a founder that explained me how he intends to do things, but. So a lot of this is resource, you know, like uh, they're, they're really good resource. The, the playbook, you know, now it can be can be read like uh, because it's been written and it's being still written all the time. So there's lots of resource. And even if you can't dedicate as much as I do, like it is interesting to to have some into the radar. I think what's really making the, the, the difference is one, if you have the liberty to practice some of this advice and in some organization, I don't know, you see a nice idea in one of these newsletters, but then you're told it's going to take three times of development. But maybe you've got a friend who's got a small app with 2,000 users and you can just try it out there, you know, and make a small, have a side project or small experiment like this. And I think like learning by doing, even if it's a tiny scale, is, is, is helping a lot. That's actually how I started with ASO back then before paid acquisition uh, because nobody wanted me to, to hire me. I just did it for tiny apps. I mean, the scale was ridiculous. It was not really a business, but I learned so much about a field that nobody knew about, you know, that was, that was beautiful. And so learning by doing whenever you can and don't feel only limited by, I have to do it for my company. Maybe you can do it a little bit on the side or, or fake, you know, just uh, fake it till you make it. Like, uh, it's fine. You will learn some stuff too. And the last one for me is have a network you can exchange, you know, a lot of these topics, nobody knows. It's not like, Somebody has the ultimate truth or whatever, and especially when you're when you're on on, on really new stuff and and things changing fast. Um, for for me, it's beautiful to be in a, in a few of those slacks and a few. Uh, also, have a bit of visibility online helps, you know. But just reach out to somebody and like, oh look, I'm working on that topics. So I heard you iterated a lot. Do you have half an hour so we can exchange around this? You have to be smart about it. You can't poke people time for free like just asking questions. So it goes both ways. You exchange a bit. But over time, you know, you know, I would have developed something that, okay, if I have a question on SCAD, I would ask that person. And I know a TikTok ads expert. And I know a, a data analyst that is unbelievable at uh, predictive LP. And I would have somebody a lot more strategic on budget. And and companies as well. I mean, people are approachable uh, and get like, oh, this company is publishing reports every six months about that. I'm going to try to befriend the dude who's writing them because it's got amazing insights and so on. So yeah, building a network of peers outside of a purely monetary interest of I'm going to become a client of this company or whatnot. Uh, and I think in the mobile industry, that's pretty easy to do. I mean, a lot of people in gaming are very open, but you can approach MMPs, you can approach networks. Uh, it's a bit harder to do with like the, let's say the big platform, obviously, but uh, that's not where I would necessarily look for my peers, but like with other developers also. And sometimes in the most extreme case, it's even with my competitors. There's stuff we would withdraw, but uh, like withhold, but there's a lot you can exchange and learn with peers. And then there's a lot of verticals that have the same mechanics and are not competing. So 
uh, you're in a fitness app and you can talk to an education app and, and to a kids app and so on. And uh, a lot of us have the same problem. So I think like big on the Slack, making networks of friends and and being open about it that that you're okay to exchange, um, I think is 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 one that that's the answer you were looking for in the beginning. I love it. I think that's uh, that's that's solid, solid advice. <laughs> I want to close by asking you the same question I ask of all my guests, yeah. and that's what is the most out of the box marketing event or or marketing uh, campaign that you've been a part of or seen? Uh, yeah. Uh didn't prepare for that one um i i don't know because i, I don't have anything else i'm i'm, I'm gonna tell you a, a crazy anecdote that's not really a campaign but i, I believe it like, sometimes whoever engineer what we're doing uh you just have to go and try and you see the most crazy thing i'm, I'm seeing a lot of counterintuitive results uh so sometimes you just have to to move on and break things um one example uh when when i was at this fitness app back then uh we're always like getting new creative and being super into the seasonality and stuff. And in the middle of summer, my best performing creative was a new year, new you uh, in July. Like, uh, and it always baffled me. I was like, what do we do for the, like, and we would like, we would change just the copy and keep the rest and it wouldn't work. Sometimes things are counterintuitive, which means when you want to, I'm not saying advertise new year, new you in July. What I'm saying is don't just follow what makes sense. Sometimes go really bold. I'm seeing way too too many people like try slight changes, small change. Oh, thirty eight dollar to forty dollar green instead of blue. Sometimes you have to be radical, provocative. You know, just like Conbase does this. Just hey, let's put a, a ten million QR code on an ad, and that's it. That's the ad. Yeah, of course. When somebody tells you that, the idea sounds crazy. Like uh, an agency offers you that, and you fire them. You're like, <laughs> yeah, no, no way. And at the end, it's what works. So, um, yeah, uh, be out of the box is is what I meant because uh, you will fail a number of times, but when it succeeds, you, you've got a big advantage. And way, way too many people are, are following the same uh, usual tricks. Uh, so be be radical and try and fail and uh, stand up again. Great advice. Thomas Petit, thank you very much for joining us. It's been very insightful. Yeah, that was really cool. I'm looking uh, forward to to more content from you and uh, especially around, around subscription. I understand there's more coming, so uh, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you for today. Thank you. 